thank uh, Uma, Imiola, Lazemba, and Cultural Communications for bringing me to Atlanta, Georgia. As you know, I'm the founder of the Ancient Egyptian Museum in Chicago, Illinois. That's the only museum of this kind on earth that I know of. The purpose of the museum is to resurrect ancient Egypt into our consciousness as a people. As you go around the country, uh, you will find African communities, such as here in Atlanta. But they are but they forget about ancient Egypt, ancient Egypt is in Africa to also. But they forget about ancient Egypt. Simply because they don't call themselves, or we do not call ourselves ancient Egyptians, and it's not your fault. We've been taught away from ancient Egypt in the school system, the society that we live in, the culture that we are brought up in, the religious institution that we attend, all teaches us away from ancient Egypt. That's done on purpose. That is to destroy the greatness of us as a people. We know that we are a great people. Is that correct? But we cannot be great until you, us, as a people come into the consciousness of being an ancient Egyptian descendant. I went to Egypt in 1992 and we, land, we landed in Cairo, Egypt. And when we landed in Cairo, Egypt, we were met by a group of people called Nubians. I'm sure that you heard of the Nubians, is that correct? And they met us there, and as we descended the, the airplane, they greeted us. They said, Americans, Americans, I'm Nubian, and you are my Nubian cousin. I says, no, I'm an ancient Egyptian, and you're my ancient Egyptian cousin. He says, no, 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 I'm Nubian. And at that moment, I was kind of, kind of startled. And then I began to realize that the Nubian and the Negro was one and the same. They, are, they were both taught away from their ancestral identity as being ancient Egyptians, right there in the continent of Africa, right in Egypt. They're not aware of that simply because they have been taught away from it. They've been uh, given this Islamic religion they have given, been given a new language, Arabic to speak. They have been given a dead white man on the cross and been trained to call themselves Christian and so forth and so on, you see. And you go into another country called the Sudan and you will find the descendants of the ancient Egyptians living there, but they will not claim ancient Egypt. They call themselves Sudanese. And they too are Muslim embracing Islam, Christian embracing Christianity. Then you go into another part of Africa and you go into Ethiopia and you meet a people there and they call themselves Ethiopian and not ancient Egyptian. They too have embraced a religion called Islam and Christianity. Now I'm saying that to say this that those people living in those geographical land areas that are just named Ethiopia, the Sudan, Egypt, are all one and the same people. They all made up what is known as the Nile Valley civilization during the time of antiquity. And then you have a large segment of us living in North America who are descendants of the ancient Egyptians. But we have been trained to call ourselves Negroes, Black, African American, Colored, Part Indians, and whatever other names you can call. 
And as you came into this auditorium today, I left some literature so you can pick up and read this literature. And in this literature, from Pharaoh to Negro, I wrote that article in 1991. Please read that article because it has a profound message to you. And if you can understand that message, then you are ready to grow and bring your mind upon a higher level of consciousness. And then the next page is telling you something about the creation of the ancient Egyptian museum in Chicago, Illinois. When it was started, the day that I opened the doors up to the general public, et cetera, et cetera. And then on the third page, you will find how Negroes got religion. And that's a very profound picture there, depicting the Negro in his slave servitude position before his white master who gave him the Bible to go out and preach this Bible among his brethren. And then on the fourth page, the last page I gave you in this pack, how we are divided, how we were taught to be divided among us by Willie Lynch, who came to this country to teach the plantation owners how to divide their slaves. And as long as we are divided, we will never unify into something of substance. I'm here today to talk about religion. We're going to have to get down and come up with a great understanding about religion. We're going to have to face reality. Now, the reality that you may face may hurt you about religion. It's going to destroy your belief and your faith about religion. But maybe that's good for you simply because maybe that's the only way that you can find your way back to your own creator, personal spirituality. And you have a spirituality because you were born with that. Okay, we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about God. And we're going to talk about the creator two different entities. Going to, I'm going to tell you that God is a man. You're going to say, what? I'm going to tell you a lot of things that may shock you, may open your mind. I'm going to tell you some things that you may already know, which is okay. Nothing wrong with that. But we have to grow. We're going into the 21st century. And we're going to have to grow. And we're going to have to have knowledge to grow. And you're going to have to have different scholars among us to bring a different message in order for us to grow. That's the only way we can grow, okay? You're going to have to listen to the message from someone who loves you, someone that is the same as you. No outsider is going to bring you a message to liberate you, to liberate your mind, to enhance your mind, to bring your mind and your spiritual consciousness on a higher level, but one among you, okay? I am one like you. So I'm here to hopefully bring some new knowledge and a new concept of thinking to the table. Now, I wrote a book called The uh, the historical origin of Christianity. In this book, I'm saying that there's never been a man that ever walked to earth in human form of any race, creed, or color by the name of a Jesus Christ never existed. Also in my lecture and in this book, I'm telling you that there's never been a man that ever walked to earth in human form by the name of a prophet Muhammad. So Muslims don't feel secure never been a prophet Muhammad either. There's never been men that ever walked to earth in human form by the name of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, or Moses. That all religions are man-made, pagan, heathen, occult religions 
based on mythology. That's all religions are. And to prove that, I'm going to tell you this. No one coming into this world in human form was born with a religion. Is that true? You know anybody was born a Christian coming out of their mother's womb? You know anybody was born a Muslim? Religion of all kinds are man-made. And today I'm going to try to help you get back in touch with your own personal spirituality. And it's very simple. Because you walk around 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, seven days a week with your own personal creator-given spirituality that your creator gave you at the time of your birth using your mother and your father as human instruments to bring you into this world in human form. And that she, he creator, gave you an indwelling spirituality that's in tune, in place, and hooked up to the omnipotent spiritual consciousness by way of your pineal gland. You have a pineal gland that you were born with. And that pineal gland that you were born with is a sensor organ that sits in the middle of your brain. It serves as a receiver and a sender between you and your creator. And the bottom of that pineal gland is your nostril. What do you do with your nostrils? You intake air that keeps that indwelling spirit alive inside of you. That's what the pineal gland does for each and every human being. You have a pineal gland, you were born with it. You are in constant contact with your creator every day of your life. Now, if the creator wanted you to have a religion, then you would have received that religion at birth. But you didn't have a religion. You was not given a religion when you were born. You were given this divine and dwelling spirituality. Now, if you can understand what I just told you, then you are free of religion for the rest of your life. And it's very simple. You were born with the spirituality, use it. Get in contact with it. Because every time that you embrace a religion, you take that free spirituality that your creator gave you at the time of birth and put it in bondage. That's what you're doing with it. Because every religion has laws, rit rituals, customs, and ceremonies that you have to abide by. When I was in Egypt, those Muslims pray five times a day over there. They even, they even have special rugs for their knees. No matter what time of day, at a certain hour, they drop everything and they go and fall on their knees and he said, and they up and down praying and when they get through, they come back and continue their business. What happened to people like that? They have been indoctrinated into a religion, a man-made religion that have put their own spirituality, their creator, free, given spirituality in bondage by accepting the religion. This is what happened. You see, nobody was born with cigarettes. You know anybody that came out of their mother's womb smoking cigarettes? You don't, you don't know nobody that came out with a cigarette. You don't know anybody that came out of their mother's womb drinking alcohol or using drugs. Drug you alcohol use, tobacco use, and religion are all man introduced, introduced by man to control you, to control your spirituality. And here's another thing that religion is doing to us as a people. It is dividing us as a people. We will never unify 
as long as we embrace a religion. Okay? Because you take Jehovah Witness. Jehovah Witness can't come in this meeting here today. It's against their religious principle. They can't do that. Am I right or wrong? Okay? The Muslims and the Christians have a division. They don't like each other, so to speak. They kill each other. Jews don't like the Muslims. The Christians don't like the Jews. And the Christians don't like the Muslims. And it goes on and on and on. And here we are, caught up in these various religions that's keeping us divided. We're going to have to unify ourselves in order for us to get back to our own spirituality. And if you can understand what I'm saying to you, you will never have to go to church again in your life and deal with Reverend C.T. Chicken Wing <laughs> and his foolishness. Huh? You won't need Reverend Chicken Wing anymore. See? You won't need to go to a a Muslim mosque anymore. You won't need Farrakhan or the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. You won't need that. See? You won't need to be from the blood of Abraham. I gave a lecture in California last year. And a lady was there and she brought her mother with her. And I was talking, going over different parts of religion and so forth and so on. And uh, I mentioned about no Abraham. She said, oh, no, no, you, Mr. Williams, you're wrong. I'm from the blood of Abraham. And I said, okay. I said, is this your mother? She says, yes. I said, miss, is that your daughter? She says, yes. I said, is she from the blood of Abraham? She said, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> so that ended that. <laughs> you see, one of the things that that we as a people have a problem with and a lack of knowledge is that we do not know ancient history and that's what we're going to have to know. When you know ancient history then you know something about your ancestral history. You see? And you're going to have to go back into the time of antiquity and the greatest civilized people that has ever walked the earth were our ancestors, the ancient Egyptians, who never practiced a religion. They had a spiritual way of life. They knew the laws of the universe. And they called those laws the laws of Mayat, cosmic laws of Mayat. And they lived by those laws, you see? And they built themselves a great civilization that lasted over 9,000 years until the European came on the scene of history and disrupted that great civilization. Okay? But they built themselves this great and glorious civilization in ancient Egypt. Not with a religion, but they were in tune with the omnipotent universal spiritual consciousness. And they built the greatest edifice that has ever been built on planet earth the great pyramid everybody knows about the, the great pyramid is that right they built a sphinx the body of the sphinx is one city block long how did they do that they were geniuses your ancestors the ancient egyptians were geniuses but they didn't have a religion religion would have crippled them would have destroyed them, okay? And here today, the descendants of that, those great people, the ancient Egyptians, are now embracing a dead white man on the cross and saying that this dead white man is my personal savior, okay? And every Sunday morning, the descendants of the ancient Egyptians are in these churches being encouraged by Reverend Chicken Wing to say, if you have any problems, bring your problems to the Lord Jesus Christ. And this Lord Jesus Christ is a European white man who is 
your enslaver. Is that right? Who is your oppressor? But somehow we are encouraged to bow down to this dead white man on the cross. And then in Christian theology they tell you that God so loved the world. Now God now, God is a he. So loved the world that he sent his only begotten son, another male, to save the world from sin. And that son happens to be a European white man, the image of a European white man. His only begotten son. But uh, that means that there's no other race of people. It's the son of God. Only the white man. See, you have to realize what is being taught to you and listen and ask questions of what's being taught to you. Now why is this European the embodiment of God on earth? Political reason. There's a reason for that. You have to understand that. So in my book, The Historical Origin of Christianity, I have put together for you historically, step by step, the historical origin of Christianity. Now there's never been a man that ever walked the earth also by the name of the prophet Muhammad because this image here, this Jesus the Christ image that we all know, and the faceless image of the prophet Muhammad is one and the same. But no, every religion has its own story, its own theology attached to each religion. And they give a birth date for a prophet Muhammad. They give a birth date for a Jesus the Christ. And they give you a date and a time of a Abraham and a Isaac and a Jacob and a Moses, all in religious theology. But if you came outside of your belief in these religions, you will never find evidence to prove that there was a Jesus Christ walking the earth. You cannot find evidence outside of your belief to prove that there was a prophet Muhammad. You cannot go outside of your belief to find any evidence of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, or Moses. You have to realize that you have been fooled by these religions. You have been fooled by these ministers. You have been fooled by the leaders because the leaders and the ministers, they have been fooled themselves. Okay? So you're going to have to really dig into the understanding of these various religions in order for you to find your own spirituality, in order for you to understand who you are spiritually. Okay? You have to understand who you are spiritually before you can understand these religions. Or, let's go on the reverse side. You have to understand religion before you understand your spirituality. And your spirituality is right up on your nose every time you take a breath. That's your spirituality. And when you embrace a religion, you're clogging the artery of your spiritual, natural, birth-given spirituality. That's what you're doing. You're clogging that artery between yourself and the Creator by believing in a man-made religion. Okay. Then you're going to have to understand that we have to make our way back to ancient Egypt. I cannot reiterate that enough time in order for you to understand that. That is the only entity that we have and the only avenue that we have that will take us back to our greatness. And once we get back to ancient Egypt, and once we get back in touch with our own personal spirituality, then at that time we can begin to unify as a people. And once we unify as a people, then we can do anything that we want to do. You remember in 1983 in Chicago, Illinois, there was a man by the name of Harold Washington who ran for the mayoral ship of the city of Chicago. Everybody, anybody remember that? Well, something happened in Chicago that year 
our community, our African community in the city of Chicago, unified around one man, one ideology. And that ideology and one man was Harold Washington to put him on the fifth floor of City Hall to be the mayor of the city of Chicago. Little children going around with Harold Washington buttons. Young people, high school, teenagers, walking around with Harold Washington buttons. Middle-aged people, old folks, walking around with Harold Washington buttons. And his white opponents would say, you know, I have a black book on Harold Washington. We said, we don't have, care if you have a green book on him. We're going to vote for Harold Washington. Well, you know, Harold Washington went to jail. So what? We went to jail too. <laughs> well, you know, Harold Washington just don't pay his gas bill. So what? We're behind our gas bills too. We're going to vote for Harold Washington. And they had a political analyst in Chicago who said, I've been a political analyst for 35 years, and there's something out there that I can't put my finger on that's happening to that community. I knew what was happening. The thing that was happening to us is that we were unifying ourselves. And when we unified ourselves, what happened in Chicago? Harold Washington went to the fifth floor, didn't he? He went to the fifth floor because we unified ourselves. Okay? And this is what we're going to have to do. We're going to have to unify ourselves. We're going to have to shed ourselves of all religion in order for us to see who we are spiritually. I was at the University of Chicago last year to hear a lecture by a member of our race. He had graduated from the University, University of Chicago Theology School of Divinity. And he was teaching at uh, one of the colleges in California. And he was up there, he was very proper. He was using great big, huge college, university words that you knew nothing about. At least I didn't. And uh, he was rattling off all kinds of books that you can buy and so forth and so on. So anyway, at the end of his lecture, I had questions and answers and I raised my hand. And uh, he pointed to me. I said, sir, let me ask you a question and make a suggestion at the same time. The question that I want to ask you and suggestion that I want to make is this. Do you think it would be better for you to teach your students about the historical origin of these various religions? And the man, to my dismay, got heartless mad at me. And a long story short, about 30 days later, I woke up one morning with that on my mind. I said, why did this man get so mad at me? And the answer came back to me. And this is the answer. The answer that I received was this. If an individual knew the historical origin of a religion, they will never embrace the religion as long as you live, if you knew the historical origin of it, okay? What they teach you about these various religions is traditional religious theology, the nice part, the things that they want you to know, the things that they have prepared for you to know, okay? But on the other side of the coin, they don't teach you the historical origin of it. Because if you knew the historical origin of a religion, you would never embrace that religion. In my book, The Historical Origin of Christianity, it tells you how the European, Alexander the Greek, coming into Egypt in 332 BCE, how he tried to get himself admitted into the ancient Egyptian priest society. He was rejected. He died nine years later. 323 BCE. And in his place came Ptolemy I, one of his army generals called Lagi, called Sotar. S-O-T-E-R means savior. That's very important because you do have a savior in Christianity. Is that correct? Okay. 
This Ptolemy Lagi tried to get himself admitted into the ancient Egyptian priest society. But he also was rejected. So what happened was that he found a priest society in Memphis, Egypt to make his image into a god. The Greeks and the Romans knew that in order to rule Egypt they had to be accepted into the ancient Egyptian sacred priest society. But they were rejected because the ancient Egyptian priest society did not take foreigners into their priesthood, and especially Ill illiterate, savage foreigners. Okay? So you have to remember that when the Europeans came into Egypt, and it still stands today, that he was an agnostic. He didn't know he was, but he was. Atheist, psychopathic, schizophrenic, uncivilized individual. That's what he had. And when Ptolemy found this priest society in Memphis, Egypt, he says, make my image into a god. And they took two of our ancient Egyptian gods, Osiris and Apis, and made a composite of the two and came out with the name Osirapis and gave this title or this name to Ptolemy I Lagi and called him Serapis and gave him the characteristics of our god Osiris or our ancestor Osiris and he at that time took his image and tried to get it accepted into the priest society throughout Egypt rejected he wanted his image to be put into the temples throughout Egypt to be worshipped right along with our royal ancestor Osiris rejected so he closed down all the temples throughout Egypt and he confiscated all of those divine scroll manuscripts that our ancestors had created over the centuries and over the years. And he housed them in the temple that created his image into a god. You see? You see, you have to understand also, during the time of antiquity, our ancestors worshipped and gave homage to their ancestors, our ancestors, such as Osiris, the father, such as Isis, the mother, and the son, the S-U-N, Horus. Those were the royal ancestors of the ancient Egyptian. And when the European came, he wanted to be made part of that. And he wanted someone to make him a god. You see, God is a man. So it is very It is very difficult for anybody to pray to God. When you're praying to God, you're praying to a man because when you look up God in Webster's Dictionary, it says a male deity. Then it goes on to say a supreme being. And when you look up goddess, it says a female deity, but it never says a supreme being. Okay? And these religions destroy the female out of every one of these religions. Am I right, sisters and brothers? That's correct. And when these temples were closed down throughout Egypt because they refused to accept this European and worship He closed the temples down, confiscated all of their divine scroll manuscripts and divided the community. And he told the priests and priests, you cannot build any other temples. So they began to have spiritual fellowship in their homes. Okay. And as the years went by, we're going to go to a time of Constantine. Everybody heard of Constantine? Okay. We're going to go to the time of Constantine.
there was an exterior Catholic religious community there that refused to accept this European and worship this European as a god. They only had a hand few of these male type Coptic Uncle Tom Egyptians. They were the Uncle Toms of antiquity. But they accepted these were the bourgeois Coptic Egyptians. Now we have some of those in our society today. And they all of them were white folk. They never come down to the grassroots and walk among and talk among our people. So these bourgeois were the ones that kept this Serapis along with the Greeks and the Romans alive, this image. Okay. This image of Serapis is known today as Jesus the Christ. There it is right here. And when Constantine came to power, Something happened during this time. There was a division in our community at that time. It is called and known in history as the Dionysus Schismatic Controversy. That controversy came about when members of that religious community turned over sacred writings to Diocletian, the Roman emperor at that time. And the division came about when members of that community, such as Donatists and, and Bishop Secundus, said you were supposed to have martyred yourself instead of turning those divine writings over to this Roman emperor. You're supposed to have martyred yourself just like your predecessors and your ancestors before you. And so, so what happened was that community over in Egypt was divided all across North Africa. I'm going to give you an analysis of that. In Chicago, I told you about the unification that we had in our community when Harold Washington was being elected and elected in Chicago, right? When Harold Washington died, division set in. Okay? Our political based community was divided. What happened during that division was a white man came right up in the middle of it and became mayor of the city of Chicago, Richard M. Daly. Okay. He's the mayor today because of the division that happened to us in Chicago. So the same thing during the time of Constantine, and we're talking about in the fourth century, a division came about and is known in history as the Dionysus Schismatic Controversy. Okay. That controversy caused Constantine to go to a member of the exterior Coptic religious community who had refused to accept this white man as God and made a deal with that individual. That individual's name Sylvester I said, listen Sylvester, if you accept So rape us, this white image, into your community and get the rest of your people to do the same. I will give you my imperial emblems of authority over that community. In other words, you will be the head NIC. You know the head and you know what HNIC means. <laughs> and I, all I want is to be baptized in that community, in your community. That's all I want to do. And if you do that, you will have authority over the whole community. I have no authority. So Sylvester accepted that. And he became the head HNIC over the Coptic community. And that deal is known in history as the as donation of Constantine. That's the name of it. It's all historical. The donation of Constantine. And then we also had a bishop in our community by the name of Arius. He said, no, we cannot accept that because this image of Serapis is nothing but a created creature dissimilar from the father Osiris, 
but nevertheless a creature nevertheless. And that caused what is known in history as the Nicene Council. Anybody heard of the Nicene Council? Those three things caused the Nicene Council to come about. It's all in my book. And at the Nicene Council, they took that image that we know today as Jesus Christ, then known as the Rapids, and inserted it into our ancient Egyptian divine triad. The ancient Egyptian divine triad consists of Osiris, the father, Isis, the holy Hathor cow mother, and Horus, the S-U-N. They took Horus out of that divine triad and put in a European white man as the S-O-N. And if you listen to the, the preachers, they tell you that Jesus Christ is the Son of Man. You ever heard of that statement? That's true. Man created Jesus the Christ. Okay? So, this image was inserted right there in the council called the Council of Nicaea I, or the Nicene Council. And that is also called the Nicene Council, or the Council of Nicaea, is also called the Homotius Council, creating what is known as the Homotius Creed. Okay. And then we're going to move up to another council meeting 56 years later, the Council of Constantinople I in 381. That council was called because the Roman government accepted the Nicene Homotius Creed as their government creed. And they wanted everybody under their jurisdiction, especially the Coptic Egyptians, who had rejected that image for over, going on over 700 years, had rejected that image, refused to worship that image. They wanted that community to accept this European image as their God. And when that uh, community refused, then this Roman ruler began to uh, confiscate and confiscate their property, their personal property, and so forth and so on. But he was reminded that, hey, you can't do that. A bishop by the name of Ambrose said, you can't do that simply because of the donation of Constantine. See, the donation of Constantine gave him no power over our community, this European Roman. So he had to back down and give those homes and things that he confiscated from that community back. And then we're going to go up to, I'm trying to walk you through the historical order of Christianity in a, in, a, in a short overview. Then we're going to go up to the, the most important council meeting that has ever existed in history. And that's the council meeting where they made this image that we know as Jesus the Christ, then known as the Rapist, into the Christ. Now the, the Nestorian monophysite, the monophysite is an individual, Coptic Egyptian, who believed that this image that we know today as Jesus Christ, then known as the Rapist, had only one nature, a spiritual nature, but not a human nature. So how does one get a human nature, you have to be born through the body of a woman. Is that correct? Yeah. So now here these male type Uncle Tom Negro, I have to call them, use that word Negro, but they were Coptic Egyptian. They called this council meeting called the Council of Ephesus 431 to get this created creature, Serapis, known today as Jesus Christ, a human nature. And here's how they did it. They went into our ancient Egyptian divine triad and took our female goddess Isis out of that triad, or out of that trinity, and discarded her. And they created a created creature called the Virgin Mary and gave that created creature the title of Theotokos. The word Theotokos means the mother of God. And they took that created creature 
the Virgin Mary with that clear title, Theotokos, and they amalgamated her, or that name, or that creature, with this other creature, Serapis. And when that was done, this Serapis image had a diaphosinic nature, had two natures, a spiritual nature and a human nature. And now, these Coptic male Kite Arnold Tom said that now you are the anointed one. Now you are the Messiah. Not A-H, Messiah. That's a different <coughs> meaning. A-A-F. In Coptic, Egyptian, Greek means Christos. In English, Christ. So they, these Uncle Tom, male type ancestors of ours, created this image 751 years prior to the Council of Ephesus. And now, 71, 751 years later, they have given this image a human nature and a spiritual nature, a diaphoretic nature. Okay? So, that's how this image got to be the Christ. And then the Nestorian, the Monophysite, still said we're not accepting that. That's those grassroots Coptic Egyptians, like we are, not the bourgeois. And then another council meeting was called, the, call, the Council of Chalcedon. And at the Council of Chalcedon, 451, they said, we're going to end all of the arguments over this issue. What went on 20 years prior is valid, without any argument. And they end that council meeting called the Council of Chalcedon. And at that point, Christianity as a religion began at that point. Okay? This is history. But when you embrace a religion, they don't tell you this. They're not talking about this in traditional religious theology. Because if you knew this, you would be a Christian, wouldn't you? If you knew how, the, how this dead white man on the cross got to be the Christ, and how your ancestors, our ancestors, created this image, how our ancestors, your ancestors, fought against this image, of accepting this image, you would never embrace a religion. Okay? And in my book, I'm also telling you that you heard of the Prophet Muhammad, the name of the Prophet Muhammad? Never been a Prophet Muhammad. Muhammadism came out of monophysite Christianity. I asked Muslim, he said, do you, you're Muslim? So yes, brother, I'm a Muslim. I said, do you know the historical origin of Christianity? The answer is no. Then you know nothing about Islam. You know nothing about Islam. You don't know the historical origin of Christianity. Because Mohammedism came out of Monophysite Christianity. Okay? And the name Muhammad, it's in my book, was not created until 1240 ACE. It had nothing to do with a prophet Muhammad, the story that they tell you about somebody born in Mecca in 634 and all that little kind of stuff. Come his wife was Khadija, you know, and his daughter was Fatima, and they go on and on, you know. <laughs> you know, they tell you that uh, his, his, his father-in-law was Abu Bakr, and the successor of Abu Bakr was Omar, and the successor of Omar was Uthman, and then his nephew was Ali, and Ali married his daughter Fatima, and it goes on and on, all based off of lies. Okay? It was Mohammedism before it was Islam. Okay? And the name Muhammad, like I mentioned before, did not come about, it was not created until the 12th, 13th century, 1240s to be exact. Okay? And that name was Abwigwa of Muhammadiyah. Abwigwa means to sing the praises 
of Muhammad. You know that when a Muslim speaks the name Prophet Muhammad, they say peace be unto him with brother and they go through a whole lot of rituals. You know, they're just making an excuse for pronouncing the name. That's all out of our wigwa of Muhammadiyya, or the near Muhammadiyya. You see? So, in my book, I'm touching on something about Islam also. So we have to know these things historically. If we are to advance ourselves, going into the 21st century as a people, we have to have knowledge. We have to have scholars who have done the research to back up the scholarship. And it's a funny thing, I have a $5,000 reward, I will use that term, for anybody of any race, creed, or color to repudiate what I'm saying. When I say there is no Jesus Christ, repudiate that. When I say there is no Prophet Muhammad, repudiate that. When I say there has never been men that walked the earth in human form by the name of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Abraham, and a Moses, repudiate that. Not by words, not by barber shopping, not by pool room talk, not by parking lot talk, not by hanging on the corner talk, I'm saying repudiate it. Do some research. Write a repudiating paper and give it to me. Say, Mr. Williams, I have heard what you said about these religions, and I repudiate what you're saying, and this is my research. Hasn't been done. I'm on talk radio, especially in Chicago a lot, and they bring up rabbis to get me. They bring up Roman Catholic priests to get me. <laughs> they bring up Muslims to get me. They bring in Jehovah Witness to get me. I asked the Jehovah Witness one day. I said, listen, are you a Jehovah Witness? Oh, yes, I'm a Jehovah Witness. I said, who is the founder of the Jehovah Witness sect? And he, his mouth he flew open, big silence on that, and flies and swam around. <laughs> he couldn't tell me. Who the founder? I said, you, me and Tim, you going around worrying people, knocking on people's door, worrying the hell out of people. You understand? You got some kind of Jehovah Witness. Let me have a few words with you, brother. I'm going to tell you about your Jehovah Witness in the Watchtower. And you don't, know, don't even know the founder of the sect. I said, now you're going to come up to me and want to debate me on something that you know nothing about. You know, so I understand that. So my reward is still there. Okay. And as I go around the country, I run into Muslims, especially coming from the nation of Islam. I'm not criticizing, but I'm bringing out a point. They're the most hard-headed people I've ever seen in my life. You can't tell them nothing. See? They know everything, but they're going to call you brother, too. Now, brother, no, you're wrong. See? And I only know one person on earth that knows everything. You know who that is? A fool. A fool knows everything, because you can't tell a damn fool anything. Mm -hmm. See? And in my book, I'm explaining to you about the word fact. And this is what I'm presenting to you, fact, which are stronger than argument, more profound than reasoning, more dependable than opinion, solaces dispute. Fact supersedes prediction and fact in the argument, unless you're talking to a fool, then you can present all the facts you want. A fool will never recognize a fact when he sees it. See? So what we have to do is gather our facts, know who we are, find our way back to ancient Egypt, get in tune with our own personal spirituality, and when you do that, you will find yourself in tune with your Creator who created you. That's who you find yourself in tune with. And once you find yourself in tune with your Creator who created you, then you won't ever need a religion. And you especially have to know the historical origin of these very religions. And you will never, I'll guarantee you, you will never embrace a religion as long as you live. You'll run as fast as you can. Somebody pull up a dead white man in front of your face. <laughs> yeah. 
I was on a, I was on a, a talk radio show one time with a white minister. And he told me uh, off the air that he couldn't do anything with me, historically. And he said, listen, Brother Williams, no, don't call me Brother Williams. Okay, I'm not your brother. Okay. He said, uh, you should be a Christian. I said, for what reason? Tell me the advantage that I would have by being a Christian. And he went on and said, well, a Christian, you become a Christian, it makes you a I mean, a, a docile. <laughs> It'll make you loving everybody. It'll make you turn down the cheek <laughs> to your ad adversary. It'll make you a better person. It'll make you a decent human being. I said, I, okay, I'll tell you what I'll do. I will become a Christian if you go among your people, white folk, and you teach them this wonderful religion called Christianity. And after you teach them this wonderful religion called Christianity, if I see them docile, humble, <laughs> kind, well. huh? loving, and turning the other cheek, that's right. I told him, I said, at that point, I will give me the biggest cross <laughs> that I could find as a deadest white man I could find and put it around my neck and I will be a Christian. Okay? This is what I told him. He said, so now, I'm waiting for that. When that happens, I'm going to be a Christian. I am. You see? <laughs> so, he left me alone. But now, you take a religion called Judaism. Judaism, like all other religions, are man-made. But it didn't start off as a religion. It started off as a capital entity. A capital, capitalist entity. Meaning that these were money lenders. People who took in jewelry as collateral to loan money on at a high interest. They were nicknamed what? Jews. Had nothing to do with religion. And the Roman Catholic Church at that time did not like the capitalist Jew because the Roman Catholic Church at that time was the only entity in the whole entire world that supposedly Profess Christianity, the only entity. And they taught their parishioners against these money lending capitalist Jews. And these parishioners, under the instigation and guidance of these popes and priests, would, would confiscate these Jews, these capitalists, confiscate their property run them out of town, rape their women, kill them, their children, etc., etc. So now, something had to be done by that, is that correct? Now, a man by the name of Solomon Ben Isaac, called Rashid, came along in the late 11th and early 12th century, and he created a religion called Judaism. You see? Now, they teach you in religious theology that Judaism was first, is that right? And they said Christianity was second because Jesus Christ was a Jew, they said. And then they said Mohammedism or Islam was third, is that right? Historically, that's not true. It was Christianity first, Mohammedism slash Islam second, and Judaism last. The religion called Judaism was created to protect that money lender. You see? Very clever. Rashi came from a money lending family in Trees, France. They were great growers. And like I said before, these money lenders were being run out of town, their property being confiscated, etc., etc. To protect them, 
This religion called Judaism was created by Rashi in the late 11th and early 12th century. And this is how it worked. With this religion, if you go out and you get 500 or 1,000 initiates to join and embrace this religion called Judaism, they will be called what? Jews. Is that right? Here? Huh? Okay, let me have a, a witness. Amen. <laughs> they, they will be called Jews. Is that right? Right. right. Now, the modern religion was called a Jew too, right? But now when, when the people come out to Jews, they can't find the money in the Jew because the religious, the religious Jew is out there. See, with his little yarmulke on and his little star of David and all that kind of stuff. See? So, the money lender, he is now hiding. You don't see him no more. Like, let's go into South Africa. I'm going to show you another example. In South Africa, you had the apartheid system. Is that correct? And you had, uh, uh, you had people like P.W. Bolsa and De Klerk was president of South Africa. Is that right? And they were keeping apartheid alive and in place. Is that correct? Now everybody, when you speak of apartheid, it's a terrible thing. Of course, we know that. But you hated Peter Mubola or De Klerk. Is that right? But the real culprit was the mining community, the owners of the mining community, the beer. Oppenheimer and the people, other mining uh, owners who own the diamonds, the gold, and the mineral mines of South Africa, they were the ones that created apartheid. But you didn't see them. They walked around you, among your kind there. How are you? <laughs> you, said, you, were, you went, oh, hell there. You wouldn't know he was the one that created apartheid, the one that's been killing us over there. You wouldn't know that. See, because you don't like P.W. Bolsa or the clerk, because he's the one that we see. See, so the mind owners you don't see. See? Now, so I, another analysis is this. World War II, 1939-1940. A man by the name of Adolf Hitler came to power. Is that correct? You know the story of Adolf Hitler, right? Because the Jews will never let you forget it. <laughs> Is that right? Okay. Now, let me show you about something very simple. In 1939-1940, the whole world, all the countries of the world were in a depression. All over the world. Okay? So now, here come Adolf Hitler. Germany was on the brink of collapse. Uh, unemployment was running rampant. Inflation was high. People were starving. Here come Adolf Hitler with a well-fed army. Well-armed army. It had all of the modern armory that could be found of that day. Is that right? It had airplanes, submarines, Ships, guns, bullets, you name it. Okay? That war cost $272 billion. The point I'm trying to make out, bring out is this. Where did Adolf Hitler get his money from? To finance World War II or have a World War II? He couldn't have got it from the United States of America because he was at war with the United States of America. And the United States of America was in a depression. He couldn't have got it from England. He was bombing England. England was also in a depression. Is that correct? He couldn't have got it from France. He was bombing the hell out of France. Poland. All through those Slavic countries. Is that right? He couldn't have got it from Italy because Bento Mussolini had his own war going during World War II. He couldn't have got it from Japan because Japan had dropped a bomb in Pearl Harbor. Had the own war, is that right? Where did Adolf Hitler get his 
$272 billion to beat a Fuhrer. You're smart, aren't you? <laughs> Why? Because this man said, he got it from you. They financed that war. But you don't see them. You don't see them. They're behind the scenes. I read in an in, in, in uh, encyclopedia called the Columbia uh, Encyclopedia. Very big old thick book. And I happened to be coming through that looking for something. I ran called Rothschild. It says, Nathan Rothschild, a, 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 a financier of war. Okay? Glorified him in that book. Made him a financier of war. You got a war going on in Bosnia right now, is that correct? But you cannot have a war unless you have money, food, ammunition. Is that correct? Somebody's giving those people some money. Somebody's giving them some kind of money to keep a war going. You had a war over in Vietnam. That was the Rockefeller War. John F. Kennedy got killed because of that war. Dr. Martin Luther King got killed because of that war. You see, Martin Luther King was given, his FDLC was given $400,000 by the United States government. The NAACP was given the same thing by the United States government. Said, now listen, what you do with this money, you go out and find the best legal defense that you can and bring the United States government into court. And what you bring us into court about is about segregation, discrimination that you said that this country is implying against your race of people. Okay. So Martin Luther King marched, he did everything. You, well, everybody knows the history of Martin Luther King, right? What I'm trying to say, white folks don't care nothing about you marching. They don't care anything about that. What they care about is when you tamper and mess with their money. Okay? John F. Kennedy was born into millions of dollars. See, all your presidents that are elected presidents of the United States of America are poor white men. Some of them come to power. They come to the office, they have maybe two or three or four million dollars or five million dollars. That ain't no money. Not against a, 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 a Rockefeller. Not against a Kennedy or W. Clement Stone who has over 500 billion dollars and you, I got 500 billion dollars and you got five billion dollars. You're a poor man. You need to go somewhere and get you a, a worker from the public aid office against me. So now here's John F. Kennedy up there, the president of the United States. <laughs> okay. He wanted to stop the Vietnam War. Okay. And they said, well, no, don't do that. Be cool. See, because I got all my money invested, I'm making this big, big buck off of this. Don't do that. They said, no, I have to stop it. This is. Uh, we're killing too many of our boys. So what happened, you see, the capitalists who financed this war, the Rockefellers, they couldn't walk up to John F. Kennedy and say, listen, John, here's $10 million, be who? He don't need $10 million. Huh? Because he, was, he never worked a day in his life to buy a loaf of bread for his family. Never worked a day in his life to buy a pair of shoes for his children. Never worked a day in his life to pay the rent to keep a roof over his head. He never paid a bill in his life because all of the bills that he made and his family made went to the bookkeeper. So you walk up to him, some of the $10 million, he'll laugh you out of the old law and have you arrested. <laughs> so what they had to do, they had to hire Lee Harvey Oswald to give him a big rifle and kill the man. And then when Martin Luther King came along, like I said before, they didn't care about him marching. Oh, then they gave him money. Hey, march. You want, what else you want? A couple of buses? We give you that airplane, anything. March. Okay? But he said that it was morally wrong 
for the Vietnam War to continue. And he became a dangerous man because he had the charisma to galvanize people. He had the ear of people of all races and creeds all over the world, right? So the next thing you know, he was dead. See? So these religions are created to protect the money lender. That's your corporate. Judaism was created for that. Protect the money lender. So today, religions are used for an evil faction. We as a people must discard religion. In my book, The Historical Origin of Christianity, I'm telling you how Christianity began. Please read that book. Understand the book. Please understand my message that I'm trying to bring to you at this very moment. Don't forget what I told you about ancient Egypt. We are descendants of the greatest people that has ever existed on planet Earth, the ancient Egyptian. I didn't say Egyptian, because anybody of any race, creed, or color can be an Egyptian. Anybody can be an American today of any race, creed, or color. All you gotta do is come over in this country and stay a certain at the time you're an American. Is that right? Same thing in Egypt. But there's only one race of people on earth that can be called and deemed and identified as an ancient Egyptian and that's us as a people. African. That's who the ancient Egyptians are. I don't say a word. They still are because we are the descendants of those great people. Okay? And to let ancient Egypt lie in the continent of Africa while we go around talking about Islam alaykum, while we go around and embrace a dead white man on the cross and say that this dead white man is our personal savior, while we go around and say we are from the blood of Abraham, brother, while we go around and say I'm a Buddhist, and all while you're saying that ancient Egypt is lying in the continent of Africa, that's our greatness. This is what the European structure that controls the society that we live in, this is what they want to keep us away from. See, once we keep those descendants of the ancient Egyptians away from Egypt, they can do anything they want to do. They remap this whole world, and when they remap this whole world, they, they took the people living in the Nile Valley civilization, who created that civilization, and changed the name, Ethiopia, the Sudan, Nubian, Egypt, you see? That was all one and the same race of people making up what is known as the Nile Valley civilization. But today they go around and say, I am an Ethiopian. When you do that, ancient Egypt is lying in the continent of Africa unclaimed. I am a Sudanese. When you do that, ancient Egypt is lying in the continent of Africa unclaimed. I am a Nubian. When you do that, ancient Egypt is lying in the continent of Africa unclaimed. I am a Negro. I am an African American. I am a colored man. I am part Indian. All this confusion continues to allow ancient Egypt to be unclaimed in, in, in Egypt at this very moment. So we're going to have to unify and rectify that mistake. Ancient Egypt is the only entity anywhere in the world that will give us back as a people our greatness. And we are a great people. Thank you for listening.
you say that the religion is basically our problem, but uh, you, you go back to the ancient Kemites who way of life was like a religion. So what's the difference between a way of life of the ancient Kemites and religion? If it's taught correctly, it's not going to be misused for that. Okay. Uh, a way of life as it was used in ancient Egypt was based off of cosmic laws, of the cosmic laws of the universe. Okay? These various religions, such as Christianity, Islam, Judaism, Buddhism, etc., etc., who, who, who are all man-made entities, take the same natural cosmic laws of the universe and put their name on it and say, Brother, this is the way of life if you believe in Christianity. Brother, this is the way of life if you believe in Islam. You see? So what they have done, young man, is to take natural cosmic Laws that our ancient Egyptian ancestors used in its natural form and, and then put a label, their personal religious label on. So the ancient Egyptians, like I said before, never practiced a religion. They had a spiritual way of life. But isn't a religion a way of life, though? No, sir. I was, I was got to explain it to you. Religion is man made. Oh, just a moment. Religion is man made. A way, a spiritual way of life is cosmic laws, universal laws. Man can't make universal laws, is what I'm trying to say to you. If you understand those laws and use those laws like the ancient Egyptians did, and build that great civilization like they did, you see, then you then you will understand your spiritual connection with yourself and your creator. See, it has nothing to do with religion. Okay? Okay, now one one more question. Did you do understand what I'm saying? One more question now. Okay, the point I'm trying to make is that religion is the way I understand. And I understand what you're saying. I'm not clear what you're saying because I read the book, but what I'm saying is that we need certain guidelines on this planet, you know, among ourselves in society to, to, because I think that's, that's basically where a lot of these uh, rituals and, and come from, because we were, we, we were out here among savages, and, and Prophet Muhammad supposedly was supposed to come, and the, the Quran was supposed to give us Prophet Muhammad to tame these savages that were, were out here among. That's one of the only things we missed. That's why they had to pray five times a day because they were savages. That's why they had to stop. Oh, oh wait now. This I want you to go into a speech on it. I want you to stick strictly to question. Okay, don't go into a speech on it. I have explained to you, if you want to hold on to Islam or whatever you believe in, you have a perfect right to do that. I have no right to tell you not to be a Muslim. I have no right to tell you not to be a Christian if that's what you want to be. I can only explain to you in reality, the reality of these various religions. Okay? Now I told you about natural cosmic law. I told you that these man-made religions have put their stamp on these particular laws and incorporate these uh, creator universal laws into these various religions and then give it to you. And you accept that. So if you accept that, if you you say you understand what I'm saying, right? If you understand what I'm saying, then, then, you, then that ends the question, see? Because I have given you a fact stronger than argument, more profound than reasoning, more dependable than opinion, solid dispute, supersede prediction, and facts always end the argument, if you understand what I'm saying. Young lady? Um, hello. Good afternoon. I just want to perhaps help clarify. When we live in the world, we lived uh, cosmically and recognized uh, the universe religiously, which seems to me consistently, which was and I'm hoping the word religious and consistent perhaps would help me. Take the word religion out of it. Right. And put, right. And put, and and put natural laws in natural its place. Natural laws, so you yeah. did it on a consistent daily, every day, minute by minute. It was part of us. We That's couldn't separate who we are from the natural color. Right. The natural. It was the That's so correct. Was Absolutely right. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you got a witness in me. <laughs> Well, any more, young man? Yeah. Just to sum up this, could you name some of these natural cosmic laws that would pertain to the combined principle of gender, principle of correspondence, and so forth? Okay, natural laws of truth, justice, peace, love, and wisdom. Okay. See, so if you understand, if you understand that, then you know those are the natural laws. Okay, those are natural cosmic laws, spiritual laws. And you mentioned the word Kabbalah, you say? Okay, that's Gnosticism. Don't get into Kabbalism, because that's, that's, that's based off of mythology. 
That leads you back to a religion called Judaism. Okay, don't do that. Who's next? Okay, young man. Stand up. First, I'd like to ask you, the things that you were saying, I, I feel that are quite true. But we talk about bringing people together. And when you talk about bringing people together, you're talking about masses of people who believe in a certain type of belief. In other words, and once, once the system understands that what you were telling is true, you're talking about the wrong thing. Once the masses, if the masses were to come and say, oh, yeah, Mr. Williams is telling the truth, and he see these people start believing what you were saying. The system is set up to get rid of that person who's going to make changes. So how are we all going to make these changes happen when we understand that the system is set up to keep truth from coming out? Because they do not want us to unite. The, 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 the thing they want us to do is to keep us divided. If you start studying all the philosophers, Chris Lerano, he talks about keeping people in conflict causes division. So how are we supposed to come together when we are so divided in each one of these religions because of feelings? Because if I, if I study under Buddhism, if I do those prayers and do those chants, certain feelings come upon me. A person studying, um, he's a Muslim, he's studying, you see the Christian, you see the, um, the, the what you call the Holy Roman, they're jumping because they feel like they have a Christian experience. So how are you going to change all these masses of people who have all these beliefs, and the system understands that. And because if we, get, if, if we start following them, or, or not following you, but say we embrace the concept, which the concept is true, men and body, one and man. That's the whole concept, folks. If everybody came on the same way of thinking, things would have to change. Okay, that's what you said. How are we supposed to do that? Okay, first question starts with you. It started with me, and I'm giving it to you, okay? I'm not going to worry about myself, okay? I'm not going to worry about whether I'm going to be assassinated or not. I can't do that. The Creator Heaven has imparted in me, Walter Williams, a certain amount of knowledge. I don't know everything. Like I told you, only a fool knows everything. I'm not a fool. Uh, but let's say I was used as a human instrument to bring forth certain knowledge in world history at a certain time, and the time is now. I was born with a certain gene inside of me. It's time of my birth. That gene was put inside of me to resurrect the ancient Egypt, the ancient Egyptians, I'm sorry. But I didn't know that until a certain time in my life it clicked in. And this is what I'm about my business was doing. Now, I have an obligation to my people, you, to bring forth certain information. I got to bring that information to you without being afraid of assassination, without being afraid of being rejected by you, and etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That doesn't bother me. Number three, I do not want to be your leader. I don't want nobody following me. That's wrong. That's dehumanizing a human being, is to have a person to follow you, okay? Because you are just as much man as I am. I don't want to be your leader. Okay. I don't want any of your money, because I have money of my own. Okay. If you buy the book, I don't make my money selling books. That's not how I make my money. The book I wrote is information for one community. I wrote this book for one race of people. If any other races read the book, fine. So be it. But it's written for you. Now, you, it's up to you once I give you the message as to what you should do with this message. If you understand my message. See, I'm only a, uh, let's say, a vehicle to bring this message to you. I can't just go out there and take all of our community around America and say, hey, you have to understand what I'm saying. And you have to change because I'm saying this. I can't do that. I have no right to do that. If, you want, if you're a Christian, I have no right to tell you not to be a Christian. That's not what this book is all about. This book is containing a message for you. So it's up to you. I, the, my answer to you is up to you to do what you think that you need to do to galvanize and unify our people. Okay, I can only make a suggestion to you. I can't make you do that. Okay, go ahead. But that's what we're doing right now. It's doing what? Well. Uh, this government on April 15th says that 
you must pay your taxes. So that's a system. So in other words, the only way they can make you do what they said do is that if you don't do it, they're going to penalize you. That's a system. It's the same thing like on your job. If you want to work in this particular company, you must follow this system. Okay. So in other words, the system will have to be set up, just like the system was set up to collect this money. If you don't pay this money, we're going to penalize you. So we got to come up with some type of principle where the system where everybody can follow. If not, we just talk. Okay, I understand that. I understand that. I'm telling you now, get back in tune with your spirituality. That's what I'm telling you, to unify yourself that way. And another thing, since you speak of paying taxes, now let's can't go all day with you now. <laughs> since, 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 since you are talking about the system of paying taxes, if you understand, and if we understand the people that we are not citizens of the United States of America, never have been, and never will be, according to the Constitution, then you're going to pay taxes. You say, well, I'm not paying taxes because I'm not a citizen. But that goes into another subject. We are not citizens in the United States of America because the Constitution that was drawn up in 1767 did not make us or include us in citizenship of this country. Okay? So therefore, if that's true, and Emiola sent me a piece of literature, which, thank you very much, Emiola, I got that. A piece of literature that you sent. And it really uh, gave me another bullet. Into, into that conversation and that subject matter. So if you understand, we as people all over the country, that we're not paying taxes because we're not citizens of the United States of America and don't pay it, okay? Then they have to put out all of us, 30, 35 million people in jail, okay? All right, so we won't worry about that. But if you can understand my message, it's what, what you're going to do with my message, see? I can only give it to you. I can't make you do anything. I have no right to do that. Mr. Williams? Yes. Where are you? No, that's the 
that's the wrong way of doing it. First place, he's going to march. Uh, he uh, Farrakhan represents two religions. He represents Christianity and Islam. Okay, that's his uh, ideology that he follows, along with the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and Nation of Islam. No, that's that's the wrong way. Then, then another reason why it's the wrong way, the Nation of Islam takes from our community and never gives to our community. That's reality. If you want to join that march, you have to pay ten or eleven dollars to register <laughs> to march in. <laughs> if you want to know and get more information about the march, he's got a nine hundred number to call. It costs you two dollars and ninety five cents a minute. Huh? But now he loves his people now. Okay? Alright? So, and then the fourth thing is what I'm trying to bring out. I'm not, I'm not criticizing, I'm only bringing out facts. Okay, this is an awareness. We got, we got brothers and sisters among us. They want to take from us, but they never give to us. Okay? Alright? Now, uh, so you have to understand what the nation of Islam is doing. Okay? No. And then the, the fifth thing is that Farrakhan marching to Washington does not have a positive agenda that he wants to present to the world in our behalf. No agenda there. Because I have been to meetings in Chicago and they're talking but there's no agenda. Why are you marching to Washington? They don't know. I know why they're marching, marching to Washington. To glorify the nation of Islam, to bring attention to Farrakhan so he can charge more money at his, for his lectures and so forth and so on. And take money from our community and give nothing back to our community. Nothing whatsoever. Young lady. How does what now? Okay, very simple. <laughs> well, during World War II, 1939, 1940, 41, before you were born, the whole world was in a depression. A war was declared called World War II. You heard of it, right? People all over the world, millions of people went to work, and factories began to spring up. You follow me? Huh? Weapons and whatever else. You see what I'm saying? Money was flowing. You see? You know, we got business now. We need bullets, we need guns, we need planes, ships, everything. Let's be making this money. You see? And then the capitalist, he captures the spoil of war. You see? Because after the war, the war destroys property in cities and so forth, right? Then urban renewal come in. And he is there to, be, <laughs> to, to make more money. You see? So that's how you do that. Young man? Yes, sir. Uh, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, that, uh, that much mention of uh, teachings that were similar, uh, that preceded, say, supposedly the of Jesus Christ, that teachings that were similar to the teachings that were attributed to Jesus Christ. Okay. This is what the VA said about the DSC Scrolls. And that this is also, uh, the credit of this is given to the Essene community around the DSC, uh, around the DSC. and there was also such a community of Messi in ancient Egypt. Okay? And that's one segment of that I want to ask you. Another part was the reference to the writings of Gerald Massey, where he talks about the historical Jesus of Mr. Christ. He makes also mention of a similar type Essene community. Uh, I think he refers to them as a therapeutic, a therapeutic, the healers. How does what you, uh, I mean, in terms of your statements, uh, is, is there such a historical figure, number one, and was there such a community about this, all of this uh, fabrication? And what is your statement regarding the, the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Essene community? Okay, let me break it down. 
Let's go on to the Dead Sea Scroll. 20th century European fake. Okay? All right. Now, um, I knew that when it first came out. To, to, to gather more information on, on what I uh, discovered about the Dead Sea Scrolls, I took a class at the University of Chicago, a DSS class, a Dead Sea Scroll class. I wanted to find out how these European scholars sustain the Dead Sea Scrolls and have the audacity to bring it before the world as being something of truth and not fiction. So I went there, and this is what they did. They are saying that according to the writing of Flavius Josephus, who was supposed to have lived 37 A.D. to 100 with a question mark, okay, that he in his writings speak about uh, their theme community. Okay. But see, there's never been a Josephus. <laughs> That's the little picture for Perkia Bach. Literature using incarnated names with attached stories. Now I'm going to show you how the Europeans use incarnated names and create uh, incarnated names. Um, let's take the name Henry. Is Henry at this point a real person or just a name? Come on. It's a name. Now watch me do something to Henry, the name Henry. Henry lives in Atlanta, Georgia. <coughs> Henry is married to an Atlanta, Georgia school teacher by the name of Helen. Helen and Henry, they have two children, Flaxton and Flaxine. <laughs> every, Sunday, every Saturday, they go shopping together, the groceries, for their family. And on Sundays they go to church. Now, what have I done? This is how you incarnate a name. You take a name, you make a body for it, put flush on that name, and make it become real by attaching a story to it. You see? Then if you take that, if I took that same name, Henry, and Helen, Flaxton and Flaxine in that story, and put it into the Bible. And people are taught that the Bible is the word of God and to believe this without question, you see? And if I took that same story and put it into the institutions of the Europeans, and that story is disseminated all over the world in, in the European institutions, it becomes real, you see? And then I give you a diploma and give you a doctrine in that, in, that, in that literature, you see? Then you go out and you teach others about Flavius Josephus. So never been a Flavius Josephus. If you don't believe it, go to the library and get a set of books called the Encyclopedia Judaica and look up Josephon Literature, J-O-S-I-P-P-O-N. And in that literature, it will tell you there's never been a man by the name of Josephus. Okay? Now, you can use a name to write through. You see? I can take Henry and write a whole book on him. I can write through the name using that name. Say, Henry said so and so, so and so, so and so. His wife Helen said so and so. And put it in a book. And you believe. So they, they are saying that Josephus sustains the Dead Sea Scroll. They say also that Philo Judea, a Jewish philosopher, sustains it. There's never been a Philo Judea incarnated name. They say that uh, Pliny the Elder sustains it. Pliny is supposed to have been born 27 A.D. Written so many books. I always said, questions that what alphabet did this Pliny use? What alphabet does this Josephus use? That's never been a Pliny the Younger. Never been a Pliny the Elder. All fictitious names set up by the Europeans, created by the Europeans, put in their system. You see? Then they say 
The fourth name they use to sustain the Dead Sea Scrolls is Eusebius Pamphili, or Eusebius of Caesarea. That's never, a, they say, a fourth century historian, church historian, meaning the Roman Catholic Church. In the fourth century, there was no Christ. So how can you have a Roman Catholic Church? How can you have a, a Eusebius Pamphili uh, of Caesarea? All fictitious names, false and fictitious names, spurious names, okay? Then the next thing is that the Dead Sea Scrolls are written with what is known as the Hebrew or the Neo-Hebrew alphabet. That's never been no Hebrew. There's never been no Jews back during the time of antiquity. Judaism is the last of the three major religions to come into existence. See? They attribute to Josephus uh, antiquities, the writings called the Antiquities of the Jews. Just a moment now. Antiquities of the Jews uh, against Apian and so forth and so on. Okay? So the Dead Sea Scrolls without me going into a classroom dissertation, I can give you more, is a 20th century European faith trying to sustain these various religions out here in the eyesight of the world masses. Don't fall for it. And what was your next one? Yeah, I was pertaining to general masses. Okay, what did you say? Uh, I just... Uh, Historical Jesus in the middle of Christ. He identifies a figure by the name he names Joshua Ben Tandera as perhaps maybe the historical Jesus by which the myth is off the ground. And he associates this individual with an SC type uh, community. And he's an exchange in many ways that there was in fact such an individual that way to the Okay, well that's not true. That's another thing that the Europeans are using to lead you to believe in a Jesus Christ. You see, when you go into the Jewish sect, okay, uh, supposed to been back during B.C. time, the Scythians, the Hasmoneans, the Therapeutes, the Hemerald Baptists, the Zealots, all these names I'm calling are supposed to be uh, uh, Jewish sect, S E C T S. Okay. Uh, never existed. Okay. So don't believe that. One of the things I told you when I opened my lecture is that we as a people have to know ancient history. If you lack the knowledge of ancient history, then we're going to continue to be a naive race of people. Meaning that we can allow anybody of any race, people, or color to come up and tell us anything, okay? I'm going to move on. I'll get back to you. Young lady? Yeah, two questions. If, if um, you don't believe in the Bible, what's the Bible? Um, what, what is the original name? Where did man come from? And second part, do you believe that the world never comes to an end or will continue just like this? Okay, all right. Now, uh, the first question that you asked me, where did man come from? The answer is, I don't know. Okay? And nobody on earth, and listen to what I'm saying, nobody on earth of any race, creed, or color, no matter how much money they have, what station in life they hold, can I answer that question for you? I'm going I'm to I'm tell you why in a very simple way. Nobody on earth can tell you how they got here on earth in human form. Nobody. Okay? Now, how far back in your conscious memory that you can remember that you were alive on earth, young lady? About what now? About three years old. So from zero to three years old, you have no conscious memory of yourself, do you? Huh? Is that right? Speak up now. Say, say something because you're on camera. Okay. <laughs> Now, what happened at three years old when you found yourself consciously here on earth? You found yourself living in a certain geographical land area on earth. Is that correct? Where was that at? 
Yeah, where did you, where would you, where did you find yourself? Oh, you was in Trinidad, Mom. <laughs> okay. And you found yourself belonging to a certain race of people, is that correct? Okay. Now you multiply your experience with every human on earth of all race, creeds, and color. See, people ask me, how did the, where did the white man come from? I have no idea. Because I can't tell you where Walter Williams, how he got here. So if I can't tell you how Walter Williams got here, I can't tell you about you, you, or even you, or no white man, Chinese, or nobody. You see? So the answer to your first question is nobody can tell you or give you that answer. The answer is a mystery. Okay? Now the second question that you asked me, do I think that the world will come to an end? The physical world, no. The world of the European, yes. Okay? If we as a people find our way back to ancient Egypt, where our ancestors, great culture was cut off, we can do that. Because the Europeans, when they walked into Egypt and they discovered this beautiful, gorgeous, great, in awe civilization that our ancestors had created, they wanted to be made part of that. And they set out to put themselves up as a god so we can worship them. They also set out to destroy the institution of our ancient Egyptian ancestors. And they destroyed it all the way down to the foundation. And they used that foundation to build themselves an institution on. But the European built himself an institution using our ancient Egyptian ancestors' foundation of lies, deceit, murder, injustice, corruption, mythology, and perverted scholarship. Is that true? Let me hear something loud now. Is that true? Yeah. Okay then, you should be clapping and start to speak and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> Give me some whistles and stuff, okay? Yeah. That's true. No, the world won't come to end. But the people, the consciousness will come to a higher level and connect back with our ancient Egyptian ancestors. And that, in turn, will destroy the European institution. You see? Okay, all right? See, you know, see, we cannot destroy the European institution physically with guns because he is a master scientist of war. You can't do that. But we can destroy his institution with our mind, okay? When they come up and say, uh, well, you know, Socrates said so and so, never been to Socrates. Plato said something, never been to Plato. Aristotle said, never been to Aristotle. Herodotus, never been to Herodotus. Homer, never been to Homer. And all those other Greek non-existent names. Okay? But you got to have something to replace that. Why was there no Socrates, no Plato, no Aristotle, no Herodotus? No homo, Pythagoras, and all those other Greek names. Why? The question has to be asked. If these names existed in human form, then what alphabet did they use to write with? You see? Because the Greeks had no alphabet. And all these Greek names, they had no alphabet prior to Alexander the Greek coming into Egypt, forcing the Greek language on our people. And our people, the ancient Egyptians, were the only people on earth with a writing system. They had three alphabets. And they took one of their alphabets and applied it to the Greek language. And that alphabet, it was the phonetic alphabet. It is misnomer today called a Greek alphabet. You see? And our scholars, our African scholars are going around talking about the, 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 uh, the Greek study with the ancient Egyptians. No, 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 no. First place, like I told you, our ancestors did not take savages into their sacred society. They took the illiterate people, they handpicked their own people to come in there. 
They, they, not, uh, they couldn't, they took the Greeks and they didn't have to teach them A, B, C, D, E, F, G. They're not going to run no kindergarten. <laughs> you see? See, so, so, so we have to replace and destroy Western institutions and Western civilization with knowledge, not biblical knowledge, but with knowledge of understanding what he has done and where all his lies and mythology and his deceit and perverted scholarship is lying. Okay? Okay, young man, I'm going to get to you. Uh, I made it to uh, school of God, right? Uh, what uh, information or historical fact do you have that that was a sellout as opposed to a tactic? Because that was not the first time Barbara had been allowed to set on the throne. What was the first time what now? had been allowed to set on the throne in ancient Egypt. Oh, okay. Over the 9,000 year history. That happened several times. Okay, wait a minute. Let me, let me. I want to ask you a question. What form set on the throne of ancient Egypt prior to the Greeks coming in there? Well, they, they, they teach that the foreigners were in and out. But who? No, no. There's never been no Higgs so. I'm glad you brought up the Higgs so. Well, that's the existence. No, okay, okay. I'm, not, I'm just. Okay, I, I, I'm writing a book on the Hyksos right now, the repudiation of the Hyksos. Okay, and the chronology of ancient Egypt. Just a moment now. The Hyksos never invaded no, ancient Egypt. Never was in Egypt. No such thing as the Hyksos. I'm going to tell you why. The only place that you find Hyksos is in the chronology of ancient Egypt. Is that correct? A chronology. You understand what I'm saying? No, yes. A written chronology that the Europeans are using today. They say the first pharaoh of Egypt was Norman Menage, right? Then they say uh, pharaoh of the third dynasty was Zosa. Then they say pharaoh of the fourth dynasty was uh, uh, Khufu, and so forth and so on. Is that right? Huh? But see, that's not true. You know why it's not true? Because the ancient Egyptians didn't write that. The ancient Egyptians did not write a history of themselves. Okay? The Africans lived out throughout the continent of Africa never wrote a history of themselves. The Chinese never wrote a history of themselves. The Indians of India never wrote a history of themselves. The Europeans don't know a beginning history of themselves. History as a subject matter is a creation of the Europeans during the Renaissance era, the 16th, middle of the 16th century. So don't believe or use the chronology of ancient Egypt simply because the Europeans wrote it and not the ancient Egyptians. I go over to the Oregon Institute of University of Chicago and those doses walking off. Yeah. Now the 18th dynasty, and this fatal response I said, well, pardon me, uh, Miss. Uh, did the ancient Egyptians say what you just got to saying? Well, uh, to where are you getting it? From the chronology of ancient Egypt. I said the ancient Egyptians never wrote, wrote a history of themselves. I think everybody's, you know, they have no answer for that. So don't bring no history. So, so tell me, just a moment then. You mentioned that there were other foreigners sitting on the throne of, 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 of Egypt prior to the Greeks coming into Egypt. Alexander Greek there. Tell me who they are. Okay, well, some people would even say that, uh, that uh, Persia, Persia. Never been a Persian. Okay. Then you if you don't believe, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you if you don't believe, never been a Persian. <laughs> you go and get, go to the, just a moment, go to the Encyclopedia of Judea. And you look up the great synagogue in there. So this is a piece of literature. And in that, they'll tell you they don't know nothing about no Persian. Okay? That's all European pseudo pseudopigraphal literature using incarnated names with the tax story to, to try to sustain Judaism, okay, in the believer's mind. Okay? I'm going to. Tell you this and I'll let you continue. This is something I want you to use as a guideline. If you understand what I'm saying, I'm going to give you the foundation 
of all European civilization. This is what the foundation is built off of. Listen. It's built off of pseudo literature. The word pseudo means false and fictitious. Spurious literature. Using incarnated names. How you incarnated names like I did Henry. Everybody remember me? Incarnating Henry? Making a body for it, putting flush on it, attaching a story to it to make it real. Okay? With narrative stories attached to it. That's the base foundation of European history and civilization, non civilization. <coughs> of course, they all, but then they take these stories, like Arnella was saying, and predate them. So you can write something in 1995 and predate it 5,000 years ago. So it just happened 5,000 years ago. And then you can put it in your institution, but you've got to have an institution when you do that. And then disseminate it through that institution to, to people all over the world, give them diplomas on it, and then people believe it. Why? Because this is Dr. Hoopoo <laughs> from the University of Chicago. See? But look, when little Walter Williams come along, you won't believe him. Because I don't have no University of Chicago behind me. Okay? But I'm telling you the truth. See, I don't study it for 22 years. I didn't study it for nothing now. Okay, now what's going on? So, now wait now, hold it. You can't tell me who said this. Is. Hold it. You cannot tell me. This is I want you to learn something, young man. Don't let nobody tell you that they had Pharaoh sitting on the throne of ancient Egypt prior to Alexander Greek, okay? Because every time you bring up someone, knock it down. Go ahead. That's, that's no problem. Okay. Move on. Thank you. 
describing the study we will be referring to. Okay. Where are you getting the word comedic from? Well, uh, this is the word I learned from uh, uh, George E. Reverend George. Reverend George E. <laughs> okay. Okay. So on the next page. Okay. Here's what uh, my answer says this. I've asked people, but this is not the first time I've been asked that question. I asked them, where are you getting the name comedic from, or chemite, or chem from? They're telling me from the hieroglyphics, okay? And I come back to them that, and tell them that the hieroglyphics has never been deciphered. So you can't get that from the hieroglyphics. See, because they're saying that the word chem or chemetic means black land, okay? And they, the, the, the people of the African community feel good about that. But see, I'm not going to let you feel good based on a lie, okay? They're saying that they're getting the word chem or chemetic or uh, chemite from the hieroglyphics. I shoot back and say, well, the hieroglyphics has never been deciphered, okay? So if the hieroglyphics has never been deciphered, then you cannot get no chem from the hieroglyphics. You've got to come a different route. And they, so far, haven't come a different route to tell me how this word chem came about. Now, I can tell you how the word Egyptians come about, or Egypt came about. It was coined by the Coptic Egyptian speaking Greek. A lot of, a lot of times, people in the audience say, Mr. Williams, you know, they get all indignant because they don't like what I say about their religion. Uh, you speak of the ancient Egyptians, yes. That's the Greek word, yes. Explain that to me. I'm, this is what I come back. Yes, the word Egypt is a Greek word, but it was a word coined by the Coptic Egyptians speaking Greek. They call themselves Egyptos or Egyptians. Okay? Just like Jesse Jackson speaking English, said that we as a people should call ourselves African Americans. Is that right? The, the white folks had nothing to do with that. But it was Jesse Jackson speaking English said that, right? So, so you got to find out where the word Kim come from. Okay? Young lady? Oh, uh, that's in my book. No, I haven't said that. Uh, phonetic. I don't, see, I don't use the word, I'm going to get to you. I don't use the word Phoenician. You know why? Because the Phoenicians will lead you back to Israelites and Canaanites, biblical literature, and Jews. There's never been any Jews born on earth in human form, according to the narrative stories that's told in Bible literature. The only place that you find Jews, Hebrews, Israelites, Canaanites is in between the pages of Bible literature and the narrative story. Only. Okay, so I don't use that. I don't use no 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 Phoenician. That, that, that's a phonetic alphabet. Phonetic alphabet. Okay, I won't get to that. The phonetic alphabet is a very good invent, invented alphabet by the ancient Egyptian our ancestors. When they migrated around the world and they met other races of people who spoke different languages, you see, and the ancient Egyptians were literate people. So therefore, when you spoke your indigenous language, they could write what you are speaking by way of phonetics. You see? Because if you don't know how to spell a word, you say, Mr. Williams, how do you spell pseudo paper? I said, well, listen, use your phonetics. See? It's how it, you, how it sounds to you, you put it down. So that's, that was, uh, uh, you have seen the Rosetta Stone, young lady? The three alphabets of the ancient Egyptians is on that Rosetta Stone. It's in my book also. So whoever bought the first uh, copy of my book, you have to buy the second uh, copy because this is a revised copy. The first alphabet of the three alphabets of the ancient Egyptians uh, is called meta nature or hieroglyphics. Okay, that's, those are pictorial symbols. And those symbols have never been deciphered. Okay? The reason why they have never been deciphered is the same thing I was going over with Emiola yesterday. Is that in order for the hieroglyphics to have been deciphered, one would have to know what the ancient Egyptians who drew those symbols meant for them to be. Is that right? That's just common sense. I didn't get a degree in that. I figured it out myself. 
<laughs> Number two, you cannot put a phonetic value to symbols. Everybody knows uh, uh, the symbol of a question mark. Everybody know how that looks. Is that right? Now put a phonetic alphabet to that symbol. Could you call it an M? <laughs> Can you call it an R? Can you call it an S? Huh? You can't do it. It's a symbol telling you to do something. Is that correct? You see that? So therefore, you cannot uh, decipher the hieroglyphics. Number three, you have 26 alphabets of the English language. Is that correct? If you put those 26 alphabets together to make words, you can only get 250,000 words out of 26 alphabets of the English language. Did you know that? Now, if you use that same methodology for the hieroglyphics, some scholars say that the ancient Egyptians had 400 hieroglyphics. Some say 600, some say 1,000. But let's take any number and use the same method that you use for the 26 alphabets of the English language. The 26 alphabets of the English language, like I mentioned, you put them together to form words, you're going to get 250,000. So can you imagine how many words that you put those symbols together? It would go up into the million, put it. Okay? Number four, do you know at this very moment that I'm talking to you that the Chinese speak Chinese, is that right? But they have no alphabet, no phonetic alphabet to write that language with. Chinese cannot write their spoken language phonetically or alphabetically. They have symbols, don't they? Okay? So if symbols could be applied to a spoken language, then the, then the Chinese would use those symbols to write their language with. When they use those symbols, they only tell you what to do, give you a direction. How many people in here drive? Raise your hand. When you went to take your driver's test, you had to, you were tested on knowing the symbols, is that right? And when they put up a railroad crossing up there, they didn't want you to put down no cue. They want you to identify what the symbol is saying. Huh? You see? So the hieroglyphic is the first writing or the first alphabet of ancient Egyptian which has never been deciphered. You see that? And the second alphabet of ancient Egyptians is called today Hieratic Demotic. And guess where that, that alphabet is, is being used and called today? It is called the Arabic script. You see that? The Arabic script, the Arabs never had no, no, uh, no alphabet. They were illiterate, they were Europeans. But in 1079, the Seljukian Turks <coughs> overrunning the Seracian Arabs who was monophysites, Christian, forced a new language on the Coptic Egyptian. That new language is known today as Arabic. And the Coptic Egyptian were the only people on earth who had a high civilization and who could write and read. And they applied the hieratic demotic alphabet that we know today as the second alphabet of the ancient Egyptian to the Arabic language. These are our ancestors who did that. I'm not going to let anybody of any race, feet, or color take anything away from my ancient Egyptian ancestors because of my ignorance. Okay? And that's how these Arabs got a script as your ancestors second alphabet called the Hieratic And then the fourth alphabet, the Jews come along and want to take that and tell about this is the Neo-Hebrew alphabet. It's called the Phoenician alphabet. And when you look up the word Phoenician, trace it historically. It goes back to Canaanites and Israelites and leads you right back to the Bible and to Jews. No, I'm not going to give them that. Change it. Phonetic alphabet. And that's what those are three alphabets that's in my book. Young lady. Okay. 
Dr. Ben Lonakaranga uh, have translated some of the Metanetta. And if, um, if they've never been deciphered, then uh, what does that say about the translation? Translation? Here's my answer to that. Dr. Ben and others, other African scholars, are using what white folks said. That's what white folks, and they believe it. Chick Amphitheos believed, went to UNESCO, him and his student, uh, Theophile Obenga, and went there and told white folks, yes, you we agree that you decipher the, the hieroglyphics. It's not true. Okay, Dr. Ben is wrong, Cheek Antidiops is wrong, Obinga is wrong, and any other African Negro scholar, and any other European scholar, the ancient Egyptian metanature of hieroglyphics has never been decided on. I just told you why. Okay? And when you when I go to the University of Chicago and speak to those so-called Egyptologists, which is no such thing as an Egyptologist, if you're an Egyptologist, then tell me how the Great Pyramid was built. If you're an Egyptologist, huh? If you're Egyptologist, tell me how the, 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 the meaning and, uh, of the hieroglyphics. They can't do it. When I go there and tell them that the hieroglyphics have never been deciphered, they, they are teaching the deciphering of the hieroglyphics. You know what they say? You're right. I don't get an argument from them. My argument comes from the Negro scholars. <laughs> because they're using what white folks said. I don't use what white folks said. I deny it and take back the control of ancient Egypt out of white folks' hands and their institution. Okay? Because I'm, I'm listen, let me tell you something. Long time ago, I've been studying this for 22 years, and you know, you have to go along with a white cane and a red tip and a dog and be running around the, you know, until you find your way, you know. I went over to the University of Chicago to take a hieroglyphic class. And I'm sitting up in there. I didn't know what I know now. I ain't have what I know. I'm sitting up in this class, and I got a funny feeling that came over me. And this is the feeling that came over me. It says, what the hell am I doing in here? Letting a white man tell me about something about my ancestors. Huh? I'm a fool. And, and what he's telling me is not true. But I'm sitting up there, little fool Walter Williams, descendant of ancient Egyptian, <coughs> letting a white man tell me about the assignment of my ancestors' writing. Okay, no, so Dr. Ben and those others are using white folks' assignment. Okay, so don't believe that. Hmm? Oh, they're, they're, they're attributing the French scholar of uh, Champollion, Young, the safety, uh, acrobat, and so forth and so on. So that's what they use. Okay. Uh, this is a new one. Uh huh. Double J. Well, uh, what do you want to know? She could speak on it better than I can. Yeah, she would. I mean, I didn't actually have to speak on it. It's not important, but. Before you get I just want to hear from her what her feelings were on that. Okay, I, I'm going to try and get her up because she's kind of shy and things like that. And she said, well, you know, uh, you were invited, not me, and, and I didn't hear all of that, so I have to live with her. So I, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm not hand fed, but, you know, I, I'm not a fool either, you know. <laughs> so we're going to try to coach her up here, and uh, we let that long for a while. So, what do you want to know and ask her about the You know, you know, I didn't read it last time, I meant to. I just want you, since I'm here before you leave, I just want to hear from you what your feelings is. Did you say you did or did not have an opportunity to read it? No, I don't know, but I will. Okay, um, and then we'll go to the next one.
in less than 500 years. Okay, it's one of the newer alphabet, uh, letters of the alphabet, rather. Uh, J as well as uh, U, those are relatively new. So I decided to do a little bit of research because, as Walter explained, Serapis has had a number of different names. And one of the names is Isis, or some of you might say Yeshua, if you're familiar with the Hebrew pronunciation. So, um, in, in, in looking up all of that, I learned that the letter J evolved from the letter I. Okay, and that's how we get Jesus today. And it used to be Isis. Just like we have the name Julian today. It used to be Julian. Okay, so there was no J. <clears throat> in some of um, your early dictionaries and encyclopedias, um, you see the two mixed together. Uh, the words that we spell today with J are mixed in with the I's. Okay, so anyway, I just wanted to detail about how that came about, and I think more germane to uh, this particular discussion is the fact that there are some spiritual meanings connected with all of this too. Like here, we call them uh, cognates. Um, in looking at the etymology, which is the origin of the letter, you find that there are similarities of meanings between like your J and your I and your Y and uh, some, a few others that you'll see in the chapter. And when you start to break that down, it kind of relates back to nature and you see the correlation. Even the S has a similar meaning. It's, it's pretty Wow. We're also adding in to help them to understand the ancient Egyptian language, right? Yeah, at one time uh, there were no vowels. Okay, but strictly consonants. Okay, um, your vowels, A E I O U, that we have today. And according to Wyden, who indeed wrote a dictionary on etymology, indicates that the vowels really tend to confuse and complicate things as opposed to, say, like, the, the, the term Kenneth came up, that was spelled K-N-T. You could just use that as an example. But now you have your K-E-N-E-T or something like that, okay, which kind of distorts things just a little bit. But much of that, I would speculate, came about during the Renaissance period when words were being re-spelled, okay, and some of the meanings were being changed to coincide with some of the um, lies that were going to come forth, okay? To my knowledge, in the 15th first King David Bible was written in 1611, and the name of Jesus was not even in that Bible. Right. Jesus, I am the S.U.S. And during that time, Jesus represented the son, the S.U.N., like the S.O.N. So That's correct. So during that time, did it come about to where it represented human form rather than a nature form. Well, you know, one of the uh, unique things about the King James Bible is that that's when Jesus became a Jew. And I would profess to speak further than that. Prior to that time, uh, Jesus, um, the name or the created creature, was not considered a Jew. That was something that was done to get back at the Roman Catholics. Okay? Because of the... Uh, all the polemics that were going on, they thought, this is the one way to get you, and that is to make your central figure a Jew. So that was the ultimate, I gotcha. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. One way to get rid of the people you owe is to send them to war. I mean, you don't have to pay them. My question is, would you please discuss uh, biblical prophecy and revelations of peace, the uh, temple and all of that, and connection with the 
current events, uh, future events, uh, the entire cosmic happening in the first place and whatnot. Do you mind if we defer that for just a moment? Not at all. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Are there any more questions for me? I'm kind of anxious to sit back down. <laughs> you, know, you said something earlier that I would like to comment on about uh, religion. And uh, one of the things that I wanted to say, uh, I know Professor Hans was being kind of kind to uh, what the Europeans have done actually to uh, some of our universal spiritual laws going back to ancient Egypt. Not only were they relabeled or renamed, uh, they were perverted as well. Okay, and incorporate it into lies. And reason being was to try to give um, some life to religion and some validation and some spirituality because religions don't have any of that until we put our belief into them. And the other thing that I want to say about religion is that if you think about it, all major religions, well, all of them, they have central figures that they want you to identify with. Okay, they tell you that you need a mediator. You know, you've got to pray in the name of Jesus to get back to the Creator. We don't need any of that. We have a direct connection as the professor has indicated. We really need to kind of keep that in mind, okay? And you get your mediators and your central figures like a Muhammad and, you know, Abraham Isaac and Jacob and all these people. Those are, those are distractions. Okay, that's keeping you away. That's trying to convince you that you do indeed need a religion to get back to your own spirituality. But indeed, religion has taught you away from your spirituality. Okay, so.
to them is that they have put a lot of misinformation into our community. I heard John Henry Clark say something uh, very profound. Dr. Clark got up at Kennedy King College in, in Chicago, and he, the first thing out of his mouth, he says, we have to stop allowing people, no matter who they are, to bring misinformation into our community. Okay, who they are? Okay, I want you to love Chick Antidiaz. Chick Antidiaz brought some misinformation in our community. And I'm man enough and have a scholarship to say that he did and, and not identify. Uh, Chancellor Williams brought a lot of misinformation into our community. And I can identify and tell you about it. Okay? Uh, George E.M. James, the Reverend George E.M. James, brought misinformation into our community. We cannot go into the 21st century. I don't care who brings it in. How much you in love with them? They're wrong, they're wrong. You see, Chick Antidiaz disqualified himself. He was not a historian. He was a physicist. He disqualified himself as a historian simply because he was a Muslim. How can you be a Muslim when history tells you that there's no problem behind it? He was a historian. He should have found that out. Uh, Chancellor Williams was disqualified as a historian simply because he was a Roman Christian. He was a Catholic. Christianity, history tells you that there is no Jesus Christ. So if you're a historian, he would have found that out. I found it out. You see what I mean? And on and on. But how did you find it out? What did you go to? What you read? I had to. What did he say? I'm telling you now. I just got to. Oh, I can't. I'm not going to walk an encyclopedia. Read in the back of my book. I put uh, some bibliography there. Okay. Oh, it's in the back of my book. So you can go to some of those resources. But I can't tell you every book I went to during my 22 years of research. I've been doing this 22 years, okay? But I've been destroying Western civilization, the Western institution, okay? That's what I'm saying. Now, to answer your question. Okay. Okay. Let's go back to Egypt. Mm -hmm. if, there's, if there's a law of cause and effect, yes. and somewhere along the line, yes. some bad decisions were made. That's right. And because these bad, bad, bad decisions were made, we are now, as a people, all around this whole global world, suffering. That's right. Because the law of cause and effect says, for every, for every cause there's an effect. So now, we made some bad effects. Yes, sir. Made some bad cause and effect from it. Wow. So now, what you, so what's happening now is that, this information we get now is causing this global change to come back again. Was well, because everybody said, who, he, he who was up would be down. Yeah. And who was down would, would, would come back up. So is this a way of us coming back up for us to get the right information, right. the right knowledge? Correct. And I think what Dr. Williams is saying that if you read certain, if you read this book, read another book, read this book, read another book, then you just we get one person to tell truth on him, another one not to tell truth on him, and then once you get all together, you put the together. Right, I think. So I think that's how you, you probably found out these a lot of lines. Yes, and you know, part of what my chapter is about, actually, it probably has more to say about this than the letter J, to use your own analytical mind. You can get a lot of information, like you just stated, and like he has stated. But you know, as someone else stated here too earlier, something about an inner knowing, somebody I've talked to over the last couple of days, <coughs> talks about that felt right, that didn't feel right, we have gotten away from using our own intuition, okay, our own imagination, and we're embracing someone else's. So, you know, we in Christianity, I think they talk about the wee small voice. Okay, well, really, that's intuition. So you get it in your gut when something feels right to you, and you get it there when something feels right to you. And you're gonna to have to rely on that to a certain degree. Okay, so, like the brother just indicated, well, you're getting information from a lot of sources, and you do have to do that. You owe that to yourself. Then you pull it together. Then you form your own conclusions. And that's a large part of what um, Professor Williams has done. Okay, he drew his own conclusions. Some people have problems with that. Okay? So, okay. Uh, Emil is telling us we're going to have to wrap it up. Is uh, this for me, or is this for Walter? Okay, I'm going to sit down. Thank you very much. Okay, see, in
my book also, I don't give quotes. Only, I may have maybe about three or four quotes in there. And that's about it. You see, I hate to read a book that every other line or every sentence is, sends you to a quote from somebody else. So this author wrote, I mean, read a hundred books on the subject. So what is your conclusion? You see, I'm not interested in the quotes about whoever wrote this and wrote that. Uh -uh. You read it, the subject matter. What is your conclusion? I didn't do that. I got it in the second book. The author is aware that this book has no uh, uh, footnotes. Okay? So that's, I did that on purpose. Uh, and getting back to this young lady here. Uh, you see, when you put down prediction and write them down and put them in a book, such as the Bible, that you were speaking about, coming through Revelation, so forth and so on. When you put those quotes down in the Bible, and you teach the masses of people all over the world to believe in the Bible, and you say, well, in 1995, I can see what the Bible is saying is coming true. Is that what you're saying, young lady? Well, that's what, in essence, that's what you're saying. Is that correct? Well, what you hear. What you hear from the, the Christian and, yeah. and the religious theology. Right. My answer to that is this. Time brought that about. <coughs> Not the prediction. Prediction is just a prediction sitting up there. But in order for that prediction to become true, time brings that about. You follow me? I can say that there's going to be many car accidents on this street out here. On Peter Street. Okay? Now, what will bring that about? Time. And if I, wrote, if, I, if I put that in the book, what I put that in the Bible, let's say there are going to be many and many and many accidents on Peter Street in Atlanta, Georgia, and put it in the book, in the Bible. A hundred years from that, people will be saying, yeah, that's right. That's, it shows a lot of accidents on Peter Street. See? Time brings that about. That's my answer. Okay. Um, Uh, 
Huh? Well, see, the thing about what I'm saying is this. Long as they get in touch with spiritual and then when they reach a certain level, you have to, what you're saying is a certain level they have to reach because they don't have that understanding of even the basis of themselves. You, you see what I'm saying? Hold it. Okay, okay. Thanks a lot. Okay, thanks a lot. Just a moment. I just think what I think she's saying. I know what she's saying. I know what she's saying. Listen. I can take a person if he would listen in five minutes and get him in, him in tune with his own personal spirituality between him and his creator, I can do that in five minutes, okay? Without giving him a religion. The nation of Islam will take an individual, dress him up, cut his head, his hair, get him a bald head, Put him a little suit on, a white shirt, and a black bow tie, and make a paper boy out of it. Just a moment now. He's not going to get up in that high echelon of prayer con in his family. Huh? He's not going to do that. Okay? Prayer con, just a moment now, let's face reality. I know you love prayer con. I like prayer con too. But if he's wrong, he's wrong. I don't care who he is. It's my mama. She's wrong. Mama, you're wrong. Okay? This is, I'm talking about reality, not, not what I heard. Okay? So, so if guys come in the, in the nation of Islam, they're not going to be put up there with Farrakhan and his family. They're going to be coming, come on in, brother and sister. They're going to shave his head, put him on a suit that he has to buy, and a, and a white shirt and a black bow tie, and give him some papers that he has to buy before they give it to him. They're going to give it to him on credit because they don't trust him. Okay, that's real, man. Okay? And then, then Farrakhan is going to tell you about Christianity. He's going to teach you Christianity and Islam together. He's going to tell you that Jesus Christ is God. I've heard him. i got him on tape. Okay? He's going to tell you about uh, the Prophet Muhammad. There's never been a Prophet Muhammad. Farrakhan is not giving up anything. If you want to march with Farrakhan, you've got to register and pay $10 or $11. Maybe the Washington, uh, Washington with him. He's like, you don't want to be around. He ain't giving him no money. That's great reality. You want to know, get some information about the march on Washington? It costs you $2.95 to call his 900 number. He's not in love with you. Face it. I live in Chicago where the, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad lives. Okay? I'm going to tell you something since you Push me into it. Yeah, I'm going to just a moment now. You can't defend this. And you have to be quiet. You have your set. And be quiet. Be quiet. You don't know. I, I know what I saw. Don't give him credit. Hold it. Doing more than what America has done with me. Hold it. 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 Because we know people giving each other a little bit, just do. Americans sit them out there with soups on and try to better them. I mean, come on, let's get it real. You want to be with realism? I've been there. He saved me. He saved me. I was thinking it's a one for him. But I'm just saying, get real. We need to get real and stop down each other like that. Just so because you sit up, he got a nice table there. But he should. But what he's doing for us, he should. And it comes to living in America. Let me tell you something. Let me tell you what they ever want. And look quick to end on the other. Then you be quiet. When I was in, I'm gonna tell you an experience in Chicago that happened in 1961. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad put a newspaper out. I'm gonna call a spade a spade now. I'm gonna care if you don't like it or not. I'm sorry. He put a newspaper out called Muhammad Muhammad Speak. In the back of that newspaper, he said. Spend your money with your own kind. Is that correct? Right. He said the white man was the devil. Is that correct? Right. But in 1961, he bought a bank on 83rd and Cottage Road called the Chesterfield Savings and Loan Association Bank. Right. He took that bank and transformed it into a restaurant. Now, I saw this with my own eyes. I didn't hear this. I didn't see it on TV, nor did I read it in the newspaper. I, at that time, was a painting contractor. I had a 16-man painting crew. And I went down there and knocked on the door. 
And two Muslim brothers opened the door for me and said, yes, I gave them my business card. And I said, I want to see the contractor who's putting this restaurant in because I want to put a bid on pain. And he showed me to two white men. Okay? That same year, down the road, Elijah Muhammad bought a building on the uh, northeast corner of 79th and Champlain. He had a white man, the devil, from the suburbs to tear it down and put up new stores there, still there. Then, down the road, Elijah Muhammad lived on 49th and Woodlawn. And he bought a mansion next door south, and he bought two other mansions across the street. He had all three torn down, and he hired the devil, the white man, to put up new housing there and build himself a new home where Farrakhan lives today. The star, the grass, put down on that property was put down by young white boys. Okay? That's deceiving us. Suppose I told you to marry nothing but women of our kind, and I'm marching here with a white woman. Yes, he said, come and get the money. <laughs> <laughs> that hurt me. Do you want to 